Hello and welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Buy Round. We are joined by my former boss in technically two roles, um, held many high profile jobs, Bulldog CEO, NRL Head of Football, NRL CEO, the current CEO of the Australian Cricketers Association, none other than Todd Greenbeg. Thank you for joining us here on the Buy Round, Todd. Well, what an honour to be here and... Um I don't think I've ever been referred to as your boss, but I'll take it twice if that's the case. Yeah, well, I think that's. I think technically, as the CEO of the Bulldogs, you were my boss, and then as the CEO of the NRL, you are. Yeah, yeah. I suppose you could put it that way, but yeah, I mean, when you reflect on it, you and I going back to I think it was 2011 when you first came out here to consider whether you'd leave St Helens and play in the NRL. Uh, I remember you being young and not naive, but pretty fresh. But I remember you telling me you wanted to test yourself in the hardest competition of rugby league in the world. And all credit to you, mate. You chose the right club and you had great success. So what a career. Yeah, thank you. I um, I remember being immediately impressed um, by not just yourself, but everybody around at the Dogs um, during that 2011 visit. And it's, mm. it's something I'm, I, I look back on and, yeah, I made the, made the right decision. We had a good time, you and I. Um, first year in into a grand final. So I reflect on a lot of those great memories at that club. I mean, it was a, a wonderful time with a lot of great people. And ultimately, my view's always been uh, great clubs are all defined by the people in them. And when you have that right set of people in the right roles, right responsibilities, right timing, you achieve great success. And that's what we did in year one, didn't we? Yeah, we, sh we sure did. Um, we are going to cover that a little bit later on. But can you tell us about the role you're doing now at yeah. um, the Australian Cricketers Association? It's... It's an interesting to hear. I, I just had a was doing some research yesterday that not only do they look after the the current list of players, but it's all male and female, and f most importantly, former male and female players as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's a big part of the role. So the cohort looks like give or take sort of seventeen hundred people. Um, that takes into anyone who's ever played a test match or a first class match in Australia for Australia or for their states. Um, since the inception of cricket, so it goes right the way back. Um, and a big part is the former player network. Um, and there are some small things and big things that we do to support those former players who, you know, in, in most respects you would say dug the well. Um, you know, every year we offer health assessment check to every single one of those members at no charge. Uh, every year, given the, the circumstances of being a professional cricketer in the sun a lot, we include a, a skin check every single year for every single one of them. We think that's really important. And we're very close to um, uh, putting a program in place for a heart health assessment check on the basis of what happened this year with, you know, we lost, you know, a couple of great Australian cricketers uh, and some to, you know, Rod Marsh particularly, uh, to a heart attack um, sudden. We think there's an opportunity to actually get in front of that. So every single former Australian or New South Wales or, Queensland, Victorian, whatever it is, first-class cricketer will have the opportunity to get a heart, heart assessment as well. And we think that's a big part of what we do for our former players. Yeah, and that's being, having preventive strategies in place yeah. rather than being reactive. Completely. And importantly, it's funded by the current players. So the current players, through this revenue share agreement we have with Cricket Australia, agree that a portion of that revenue share should be applied to those who dug the well. Yeah. And the current players are you know, very fortunate in what they earn and the conditions of which they enjoy. And they know that that's been borne about by those who came before them. So there's this huge sort of pay it back legacy, uh, which, I, which I see in cricket as being very, very unique, um, quite a mature way of looking at it. And there's one thing that's for certain on every current player. They know at some point they're going to be a former player. So they go into that cohort at some point. So giving that opportunity to continue to do that, I think is a, a real legacy piece. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You you know, as a player, you can get mm. you can be quite selfish and and think it's all about the now, but yeah. it's important to con consider the future. One of the things you mentioned there, the health assessment. Mm. So an annual health assessment yeah. is available. How would so is that on a designated day? Is yeah, so we do them in each state. So um, and w and it's actually interesting because what we also do is we try to do it in a location to bring as many of them together over the course of that day so they actually interact with each other. Because as you know, when you're a former player, one of the things you miss the most is being around each other in the dressing room and those sorts of things. So um, we bring them together, uh, they book their individual appointments um, and we bring them through that and we do that every year. 
Uh, we also, at every test match in each state every year, provide a reunion opportunity for those players as well because it's, well, it's one thing to be checked physically, but then it's also that casual connection of bringing people together. Uh, and again, cricket's quite a mature sport in this because they see the benefits of bringing that former cohort back together again. There's you know, a massive um, opportunity, I think, in all sports, cricket as well, to bring more to life the former player network. Uh, they've got so many great stories. They've got such tradition and history. So engaging them, bringing them through, I think is very valuable. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Mm. And think about Australian cricketers. Think about the history and tradition of Australian cricketers. You know, where we're talking about trying to tell stories through documentaries of that golden era of Steve Waugh and Ricky Ponting and Adam Gilchrist era and telling those stories on behalf of those players. And there's, there's just so much rich history and storytelling that I think is very underdeveloped. And it's not just in cricket. We could talk about that in union, in league, in AFL. There's great history and stories. So... You know, appreciating, valuing um, your former player network and cohort, I think, is strong legacy for the sport. Yeah, is there much difference? Obviously, there's more of an international flavour mm. for, for, for cricket, mm. um, but is there much difference in, in in how the players approach everyday life um, between le- league and, uh, and and cricket? Yeah, I, I think there's a huge difference, um, and the main difference is the global aspect of sport of cricket versus quite a domestic sport in rugby league you know the the two winter codes are big here and they're big and strong in this country but this is a relatively small marketplace and I've learned a lot being in cricket you know I just traveled to Pakistan for the the series with the Australian team for the first test and just the scale of the country and I'm going to get to India next year and experience that Um, you know Australia is a population of uh, give or take 26 million. You know, you go to India and it's a billion plus people and they only follow one sport. So it's the, the scale, the global scale is quite unbelievable. Um, and then what goes with that is the reach of the individual players they have on that global scale is incredible as well. So yeah, it's, it's different, um, uh, different in a good way. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate. I had 15 plus years working in rugby league, whether it's at the club or at the governing body. So you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but being in a different sport, another sport, but applying a lots of my learnings and experience, hopefully, will be will be quite helpful. Yeah, it sounds um, sounds really interesting. It, it it really does, and I think obviously rugby league has given you that that fa- foundation. Mm. Um, mm. It, it sounds exciting what you're doing. It. Yeah, and it, it's different because cricket's a very different sport in that it's almost, and I say almost, almost an individual sport played inside a team environment. Yeah. Um, and so being really close to the players on a tour in Pakistan inside a bubble gave me a, a very distinct look at how they prepare themselves. And it's different to footy. It's different to when you and I would go on a trip to play the Warriors and we'd be in the team room and I'd watch you guys get ready for a game. It's very different in cricket. The way David Warner prepares for that test match is completely different to how Mitchell Stark prepares. And the coaching and performance staff are very conscious and understanding that those two individuals prepare differently. Yeah. But ultimately, they're preparing differently to get the best out of themselves in order to serve the team. So it's it's a very very different environment, and you know, obviously, the game goes for longer. It goes for five days, so it's it's very different. Yeah. Um, just on your role being a CEO, mm. and th- I think there's a bit of a misconception this image of what a ceo looks like the 1920s image of <laughs> you know a, a cigar and whiskey and you just you know, or, or golf courses that um, sounds like bullfrog at canterbury Lease yeah. club back in the 60s and <laughs> 70s that's what it, i was told he did it's very different from that isn't it can you oh, can you tell different. us about the yeah. the pressures that that come with being a ceo and the, the and the expectation yeah look it, it is it is very different to you know what people may think. There's not a lot of corporate lunches or golf courses and those sorts of things. Um, these are these are high pressure roles um, with big expectations and big responsibility. Um, I've always maintained though that um, the pressure part is a real privilege because to be given the opportunity for one of those roles means that you will take the pressure for what it's worth on the way through. You know, and so I, I was very fortunate. I was I had this incredible opportunity to be the boss of the game for four and a half years and to hopefully leave a, a legacy piece that says we leave the game in a better shape than we find it and create relationships and friendships with people like you and lots of others that hold you for the rest of your life. Um, so, 
you know, I've been so fortunate to get opportunities to go into those roles. When I've approached them, what I've always thought is if someone's believed enough in me to do it, I've got to then return that and work as hard as I bloody can, roll my sleeves up and do the best possible job I can so when those big moments come that you're ready. Um, and they're going to come. It's, it's not a straight line. You don't turn up nine to five in one of these roles and expect it just to roll out normally. You work a lot of nights and a lot of weekends and you've got to be able to pivot yeah, I will, I was gonna say, I've got it written down here. I can always remember you saying to me, pressure is a privilege. Yeah. However, I think what I'm, what I'm trying to get to mm. is when, when you're the CEO mm. of the game or, or a huge football club, mm. the phone's never off. No. You're, you've always got to be contactable. Mm -hmm. And in terms of hours worked or hours available, it's 25-8. It's yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're 100% right. The other part that I would add to that description is that um, in a role like whether it's the club or the game, uh, everywhere you go, everyone else has an opinion on what you do and how you do it. And that was one of the things that I underestimated probably going into both roles, both the Bulldogs and the NRL, was no matter how, how you're doing uh, at a particular moment in time, if you're at a restaurant with your family or you're out for a few beers with your mates, someone will come and talk to you and give you unsolicited opinion of how to do your job better. Um, and they usually, you have to look at it through the prism, they care, um, they're fans, um, and they either follow their team or they follow the game, but they are desperate to tell you what they believe is the next fix or the next issue. And you can take that one or two ways. You can get the shits and say, get out of it, or you can actually say, well, that's a customer, it's a fan, it's their game, I'm trying to do the best I can. You've got to be patient. So um, I, I saw a lot of – I used to call it um, unsolicited feedback. I yeah. get a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, th you know what I'd do if I was a CEO? <laughs> I'd do this. Okay. If, if it was that easy, then yeah. I'd probably do it as well. But there's yeah. there's more to it. It's very complex. It is I, complex. I, I imagine. And, you know, certain decisions would have second and third phase consequences yeah. that – the choices that you make or the decisions yeah. you make, the the effects would be far reaching. Yeah, and I think the other principle you have to look at, and I've answered this question a few times in different forums, is what's the difference between being the CEO of a business and CEO of a sport? And the one primary difference is that sport's based on emotion and passion. So if you walk into a coffee shop on a Monday morning in an NRL CEO role, no matter what you did over the weekend, eight teams won and eight teams lost. So if you're looking through the eyes of a fan who lost, they're not happy. They've been ripped off by a referee's decision. They're going to have an issue. So no matter what happens, there's eight winners and eight losers. And that emotion and passion is what serves the game well, it, what drives the game. It, it's what creates commercial returns for the game is emotion and passion. Yeah. But you have to divorce yourself from making decisions based on emotion and passion. You have to make them on reason, measured facts and, and research. So... You've got to understand the nuance of emotion and passion, how that plays in, but not get caught into it. Yeah, and I guess, you know, it's the, you try and please everybody, you'll please nobody. And, and also, you know, I, I know what it's like. I, I view the game through, you know, very with my players' glasses on. Yeah. And, you know, fans view it through, not, they're not fans of the game, they're fans of their team. Fans of their so team. So they want things that are going to, yeah. you know, maybe unconsciously, Absolutely. Benefit their team. And not only do fans look at it that way, you know, almost every administrator um, and leader of their individual teams look at it that way too. Yeah. Um, and that's – and what you have to understand, that's okay because that's, that's what they're there to do. They're there to represent the interests of their team. So we used to say regularly, you know, the, the door that opens in front of you is usually starting with self-interest. It's the self-interest principle. Everyone comes at you, but most of the time it's with a self-interest. So – you have to understand that and, and ultimately that comes down to when you do have a leadership role, whatever that might be, don't confuse it with popularity because people quite often want to be popular but being a leader and being popular are completely different commodities. Quite often we used to have to make decisions that were very unpopular but primarily they were right or they were for the best interest of the game and you, know, you can debate all the merits of certain decisions but geez, you don't take these roles to be popular because if you're looking to be popular, you're in the wrong business. How do you define um, a decision being for the best interest of the game? Yeah. Like what, what does that actually mean? 
Well, I, I think in, in broad terms, the way I would look at it would be you can't look at it through the interests of a particular club or a particular time frame, but you have to look at it if this decision that we make today will serve the game better into the future. Um, and that could be revenue related, it could be brand related, it could be just reputation. There's a whole pile of different things and you probably have to unpick a particular one to ask some of those outcomes. And, and again, some of them are subjective. You know, I mean, the thing that sometimes gets lost is people in my roles, my previous roles, you don't sit around in a dark room and make a decision on a whim. You go through lots of protocols and procedures and information and then ultimately you report to a board and those boards ultimately endorse or not those decisions. So it's not a it's not a one man show. It might seem like it from the outside when you're the face and the voice representing the industry, but there's a lot that goes into decision making. Yeah. So what what's your decision making process at CEO level? Well, like well is it a consortium? Yeah. Or um, you know, you, I imagine you'd, you'd speak to a number of experts, but yeah. f- f- fundamentally, like how how would how would the process of a decision make a, a decision to be made. Yeah, my leadership style was very collaborative. So I used to, you know, be very conscious of giving people the opportunity to speak about a particular subject or a topic to garner as many views as I could. Uh, but at the end of the day, you take all of that information in, like, like a coach does on selection, or a halfback does on a particular play. You take all that information in, but as a leader, then you've got to make a call. Um, and you're better to make a call than not make a call at all. So I used to create as much information as I could, get as many data points as I possibly could, and then ultimately make a call. And sometimes in busy weeks, you take a lot of information in on different issues, make a call, move to the next one, make a call, go to the next one. And you have to be able to, and one of the skills I think of any good leader is compartmentalising. So you deal with a really difficult commercial transaction over here, and you make that decision and then you go over across the next one and what's next? It's a issue on a, a player who's done something stupid on Mad Monday and we have to deal with that. And then you have to go and deal with something else. And so you've got to be able to have different skill sets and make different decisions based on timely outcomes. You said something there about making decisions is, is better than not, but is action always better than inaction? Not always. Um, it'll depend on the moment and the time, but... I get a sense that um, some leaders are almost in fear of action. And, you know, the best ones I've seen, the lessons I've learned over my career is as much about what to do as about what not to do. Um, So, again, it's the fine balance. But I've always believed that the people who work around you, stakeholders, are looking for outcomes. They're looking for you to lead. When you're placed in these positions, people are putting you in positions to make calls, make decisions, get things done keep moving, keep moving forward. So I didn't used to like to sit on my hands too but, often. But then it, it's sometimes if if there's an issue, could, could it be, look, we just need to sit tight here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And there's probably examples of that over time where, you know, not making a decision. We used to talk about this particularly with rule changes. Uh, and I know the game's gone through an enormous number of rule changes recently, but we used to have the principle of the carpet bubble where we would – we would have to think so carefully about changing any aspect of the game on field because like a carpet, laying a carpet, you might push it into the corner and get it perfectly right in that corner and you turn around in 15 seconds and it's all screwed up behind you. And that was the principle we used to take into every discussion that we had to understand what we would call resultant impacts. So we make a decision over there but the impacts come over there and you have to, in some respects, three or four steps ahead on the chessboard because the one thing you do know is when you make a rule change, the coaches are going to try to rot it in order to get an advantage. That's their job. Yeah, it's competitive it's advantage. competitive advantage. Yeah. So we have to be better than that. We have to be thinking ahead about what those resultant impacts are. I'm not saying that it, we always got them right, but that's the sort of methodology that goes into that decision making. Yeah, it, it's like I say, I think it's incredibly complex. And yeah, um, like you, you know, you the the carpet analogy yeah. is exactly what it's like. You, yeah. you make it. A, you, you take action, but there's yeah. unintended consequences and you pay a price for everything you do or, yeah. or that you don't do as I'll, well. I'll give you a really good example of that. I remember talking to a former player some years ago and, and his view was the the one lever you've got to pull is you've just got to reduce interchanges back to four. Just get the interchange back to four. And I said, why would you do that? His view was as simplistic as this. Um, four interchanges, you reduce fatigue, 
you reduce fatigue, you reduce collision, you reduce collision, you reduce concussion. Now that on a really high level makes some sense, except then when you look at it and you say, increased fatigue means you lose your tackle technique. As soon as you lose your tackle technique, you have more head knocks. And so that's an example of a resultant impact where on one sense it might fit a purpose on one page, but it has a knock-on effect elsewhere. And so that's that sort of broad analysis of thinking you have to come up before you just snap make a decision. Mm. There's an interesting book actually called Would You Kill a Fat Man? Right. About pulling levers. Uh, mm. The trolley problem I think it dives into about you pull certain levers and mm. here's some consequences, how you you balance out that decision-making stuff. It's um, it's a good book, The Trolley Problem. Okay, I'll Very write that one down. Thank you. Um, obviously, we spoke about the prefer, pressure being a privilege, mm. um, media pressure, mm. um, and the the impact it has on family life. I think you were quoted as saying, after you um, resigned from your role at the mm-hmm. NRL, as you don't think you've ever been happier, yeah. and your family were going to, you were going to reintroduce yourself yeah. to your family and yeah. show that you do have a sense of humour. Yeah, can, yeah. can you talk to us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my kids are young adults now, but... Both of them said to me, you know, a month or so after I'd finished, Dad, we'd forgotten how funny you are. You're actually good company. Um, but I, I think when you're in these roles, you pour so much of your own energy and time and commitment to it that other things do suffer. No matter how much you try to convince yourself that you have the, the work-life balance, um, you don't have a lot of work-life balance when you're literally pouring yourself into every role. And... Even when you're present, you're not really being present. So that was a challenge for me, uh, on reflection, certainly. But, yeah, coming out of that role, um, spending more time with family, uh, getting fit, getting healthy, um, yeah, it was, it was like a real eye-opener for me because I'd been in that vortex of that NRL bubble for such a long period of time. Um, it was actually quite liberating being on the outside of it um, and almost finding some level of normality. And... And, you know, there's a price that gets paid for losing your anonymity as well. Um, you know, so, uh, again, just getting back into a normal normal routine for me felt bloody great, to be honest. So you you, f- you, you spoke about compartmentalising things. Mm. Being a CEO, mm. you, you feel you, you couldn't do that or you'd lost the ability to do that or you think it's it's something if you could go back, you think you could perhaps manage, manage yeah. better to... To just park it and then come back and be the dad and the husband, yeah. Or, or, or like you say, is it? You know, you talk about being present, and mm. it, and for me, it's probably one of the the biggest no nos of pursuing a, a career as a coach is mm. that I know it is all consuming, and yeah, I imagine yeah. it would be yeah. the same at, at CEO level where you know you can you you know you want to go home and be the father and the husband, mm. however. It's, it's just not happening because, yeah, yeah. you know, you're trying to have a conversation about how was your day. Well, tick, 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 tick. It just wouldn't go away. Or you know something's coming tomorrow that's going to be – there's no good outcome. Yeah. it's There's going to be negative press one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, I think we'd all like to think that you're better for experience. So when I consider – would I have learnt a lot? Unbelievable amounts of learning through that time. But I think sometimes the job's going to consume you. And I think you have to go in knowing that. That you, you can try hard, but you're probably not going to get it right all the time. Um, but I would have, you know, learnt an enormous amount through that period of time. Um, but also the thing about those positions, quite often, it can be quite isolating. It can be quite lonely sitting in that chair occasionally because those big decisions when they come um, are ultimately on your shoulders. And you have to carry those show, they have to carry the weight of those decisions, and then defend them. Um, and you know, in any leadership role, it can be isolating for people. So ensuring you surround yourself with good people who aren't sycophants, who don't tell you what you want to hear all the time, but they tell you what you need to hear, because you're not always going to get it right. It's not possible for a human being to make every decision right. So you're going to get some things wrong, and so. If you surround yourself with people who just tell you what you want to hear all the time and surround yourself with people who are just going to tap you on the shoulder and say, you were great, um, that's not healthy. So you have to have a network of people who are prepared to, I used to say to players all the time, I'm going to have to square you up on this because I think what you just said then was wrong. I'm going to tell you the reasons why. And 
And I think for players, this is a part of my role now, is don't expect me to tell you all the time that I agree with you because when I think I need to square you up, I will. And that's a sign of, I think, an open, honest relationship. Yeah. Be- being challenged is is important. Yeah. And I think if, if any relationship, I, I remember reading actually about the um, the percentage or the frequency of positive to negative um, interactions. Uh, uh, all positive in people think, oh, no, you want your relationships, be, you know, um, with, with a partner, with a friend, with a, yeah. a family member, to be all positive. Well, that's that's wrong. That's that's not a relationship. It's that's not a real dicta- life, is that's it? That's a dictatorship. Yeah, when, when everybody, when someone's always right and never wrong, that, mm. that's a dictatorship. It's not healthy. Um, so I think you want to be in an environment where you're challenged. Um, you know, I, I just... I, I was always ensuring that the feedback came outside of the bubble that I lived in. So having good people call them mentors, you, you can call them that in a formal term, but you need people outside your network who are going to challenge you and ask you whether you're on on alignment with your own set of values that you start out with and just doing that. I used to do that a lot and I used to find that I still do it. Um, it's very instructive and brings you back to your decision-making being pure. Yeah. We'll we'll just go over a couple of those um, big decisions or the yeah. the big talking points throughout your tenures, um, NRL head of football and, and CEO. Firstly, the 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 talk up the game movement. Mm. Can you tell us a, a little bit what were, what was behind that and uh, wh- where that stemmed from and what your desired outcomes were for that? Well, when I reflect on the sport of rugby league, I think. And he said this a few times, its greatest weakness comes from within. What I mean by that is that if you're running the McDonald's franchisees, the franchisees never talk down the cheeseburgers. They talk them up, no matter how bad they are for you. And, and in rugby league, I used to see all the time people talk down the sport of which they were part of and that they earned a living from. And I, I couldn't understand that. If you wanted to have a discussion about an improvement or how to take something to the next level, have the discussion. Do it below the line, not above the line, because above the line is where we create value. So above the line, we should be talking the game up. We should be espousing all of the great things that it does in communities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it was was like it used to eat itself up, Um, and it still does. Um, People used to tell me all the time, it's part of the soap opera, don't worry about it. Um, I think... Personally, it devalues it. Um, and uh, I think people should love it and respect it more, if that makes sense. Um, so that was the, the whole concept of talking the game up. But I also understand that particularly the media thrive on heroes and villains. You know, they build you up to knock you down. That's how the game works. It's how, it's how the industry is. So um, I was a bit of a lone ranger on that one, I think. Yeah, it, we should have a lot more gratitude to mm. the game that gives a lot of us everything. Yeah. We, we really yep. should. And, mm. and sometimes that only comes from reflection yeah, and from experience um, because there are times when you get down, people get angry or they get frustrated and that comes out and I, and I get that. But as a real principal point, yeah. love and respect for the sport. And when I look at cricket, cricket is, you know, when you turn on the this, this, this summer, this is going back some years, and you listen to the commentators, they, the one premise they start from is they love the game and they respect the sport. And there's this tradition and history and love that goes with it. And I don't get a sense that's replicated in some of the winter codes. Yeah, you, you're probably right there. I think yeah, news cycles generally do tend to focus on the negative yeah, uh, as opposed to... Definitely. The positive and yeah. perhaps our sport is just mm. a microcosm of that. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, another one of the um, the the things that you you introduced was a, a, a tightening of the concussion protocols. Mm. Um, we had a couple of conversations. My former yeah. self was uh, <laughs> your alter ego. Yeah, dis- disagreed uh, yeah. perhaps with a few of those. But can you tell us about about why? why the, those w- were important mm. to you? Yeah, well, this is at the very beginning of sort of 2013, 2014 when 
there were really no protocols and rules around head knocks and concussions, which is hard to believe sitting here in 2022. Um, for a sport that is a collision, you know, it's a, let's say it's a violent sport. Um, and so we put rules and policies in place and I remember being completely criticised. Um, you know, I remember back pages of turning the game soft and all this sort of stuff, you know. And I remember having conversations with you. You and I had, what do they define them as, robust discussions <laughs> at the time. Uh, and you telling me that um, it's your body and you'll do with it what you like and who am I to tell you what rules to play under. And if you remember it right, I said to you, big part of this job is protecting you from yourself yeah. and protecting the players from themselves because rugby league players are built differently. Yeah. Um, they're, they're built to to play a game that most people couldn't play or wouldn't play. And that's why they love watching it so much because they watch people like you and others play a game, the ferocity and the collision that they probably couldn't do themselves or, or wouldn't do themselves. And so they love watching that, that collision sport. And so trying to put safety into a collision sport is a very difficult thing to do. And probably more difficult than anything was changing the culture inside that sport, which said when you fall down and get knocked with a head knock, it's actually not okay to get back up again because that's unlearning every behaviour you've been taught since you were a little boy. Yeah, well, a, a lot of the time we, we are, well, most of the time, we're products of our environment. Yeah. So you put any human being into a system um, with the sort of personality traits that mm. most footballers have in terms of this is a badge of honour, this is toughness continuing yeah. on despite you really shouldn't be carrying on yeah. it, this is th this is what th this is that's heroic yeah and and when you're a product of that environment i guess which i was um i thought for what now would be a, a category 2 i believe mm. where you're not actually knocked out mm. but in, in terms of yeah, you, you'd, you'd show, I, I guess, potential symptoms or mm. f for a concussion, and na now it's it's clear you, you're removed from the field for a HIA. I, I at that time thought that should be a decision that that I would make, and mm. I actually did make that decision once to mm. to remove myself from the field to play when there was no apparent um, knock to the head. So I was li I was living that, mm. but again, I was probably blinded by my own ambition and. Uh, I prioritised winning, performing mm. above my future health outcomes and mm. I in reflection that wasn't a that wasn't a um a position I should have taken. Part I was at that time perhaps part of the part of the problem. Yeah, um, there's no doubt that's that cultural revolution yeah. that the, the game needed to see. Yeah, you know, and that's what leaders do. They they set the environment mm. For, for people to mm. Completely. behave in. goes and back to what I said before. Those decisions weren't popular, mm. but they needed to be made. And, and imagine if you don't make those decisions now, what the impacts could be later on. So I remember making those decisions. They weren't popular. They weren't well received. Uh, they, they, they were not enjoyed by a lot of people, particularly those diehard rusted on rugby league people inside that community that we lived and breathed, you know. But, um, yeah, they were interesting times and I remember talking to you at length about it during those times and and you were very passionate about needing to make those decisions yourself and I remember saying to you I remember I don't know if you remember this but I remember saying to you mate in, my job is to ensure that in 10 years when you and I sit down and have a beer or a coffee that you remember my name and I said go home and talk to Taryn about it because I'm protecting you from yourself and of all people she'll know that that's the right decision and and happily for you, you've gone on a journey where you look back on that and say, you know what, on self-reflection, that's probably right what you had to do. Yeah. And those protocols have got stronger and stronger over time. Yeah, I think that the place I was coming from was personal responsibility. Yeah. Which I was, yeah. Um, which I held, which was a a value I held dear, and mm. I still do. Completely. You know, a lot of yeah, like that, and taking personal responsibility for for your health. Yeah. That that's where where that was coming from. Did I go about it the correct way? <laughs> Probably not. Maybe I needed that to give up some of that responsibility. Yeah, I mean, it also it's it's about how you're defined either by others or by yourself. So I remember when we first met, and you know we signed this. I 
call you a kid at the time from St Helens, you know, and the the word that everyone described me about James Graham, who's this guy James Graham from St Helens? He's tough. James Graham's coming. He's he's a tough guy, and that was your badge of honour. Mm. You know, when you arrived at the Bulldogs, you were the the hard Englishman from Liverpool, St Helens, and you were you were a tough mate and. And people looked at you as being the tough guy. And tough means when you get knocked down, you get back up again. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, you know, to be fair to my, my former self, um, some of those comments were around reputation enhancement. Mm. Because there's some Completely. There's psychological warfare happening Completely. out on that rugby league field. Yeah. In the middle of in the middle of the field, especially the yeah. dark arts of like I I, I want the opposition players to yeah. think this guy's not wired upright. Absolutely. Like there's a little bit crazy in him. The crazy and eyes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he's publicly saying yeah. he doesn't care about who mm. he becomes. Mm. He's uh, he's about the yeah. now. That's and a competitive then advantage, then, isn't it? Yeah, there's a yeah. slight competitive. It's it's just that little little chink mm. that you could put in the in the armour of someone else and go, oh, God, he he, he doesn't care. Yeah, he's not dangerous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. A lot of the time, crazy wins. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and as I said, we're playing. You're playing a game that's a tough sport. It's a brutal sport where you necessarily have to put your body on the line, and so that's not lost. It was never lost on me, particularly at the NRL, where you know we would have independent. Uh, we had an independent commission. The game is governed by independent, which is great and it's the right thing. But you have to make sure that those people understand the fabric of the game. And in order to do that, quite often I would take a, a person down right next to the sideline, suburban ground, round game, stand there on the sideline and wait for a player to take a run on the short side. And when they heard that, and they not only hear it, but you feel it, you got to understand what you would do on the field is, as I said before, other people wouldn't do that. That, that physicality of the sport makes it unique, makes it so unique across the globe. And also the psyche of the athlete as well yeah so i don't know if you've ever seen um goldman's dilemma yeah yep. you know they spoke to Ol olympic athletes mm. and asked them whether or not they would take a pill to guarantee mm. a gold medal you know the the only the caveat to that is you you die five years mm. later now the results do change over time and obviously it's a hypothetical yep. situation but if he, even if one person says yes then that just taps into the Completely. Into, into the psyche. Yeah. And, and we're, not, we're, right. we're dealing with a very, very small section of society yeah. here. Yeah. And for rugby league players, and, you know, I used to say regularly, they're quite often risk takers. Oh, absolutely. And I think on personality profiles, completely. they all score highly on. So how do, you, how do you turn that off in situations of conflict or day-to-day -day or especially after a few beers, those sorts of things, how do you – it doesn't turn off and on like a button. Um, so you have to be conscious of those things and recognise that in, in how you do your business. When it comes to the messaging, is it important not just what the message is but who tells it and how it's told? I, I firmly believe that the key stakeholder to – change the environment around concussion should be the coaches yeah yeah absolutely coaches i mean you, you know it better than anyone but in that environment the coach is all powerful and if the coach asks the player to do something that player will follow um and the best coaches wayne bennett said this to me many years ago uh his job was to get players to do the things they didn't want to do or the things they didn't think they could do and if he could get that out of their his players they'd have more wins and losses so it's the same thing. So if you can have coaches who create that environment and um, create that cultural awareness around things like concussion and others, it'll have a much greater impact than anybody else in the game. Yeah, because I'm just, again, I think back to my, put my player's cap on, I sat in that room at Belmore, at Cogger or at St. Mm. Helens, and, you know, the leader neurological expert could come and talk to, they were blue in the face about how important this is or, the, yep. the leader of the game, yep. you and 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 you could talk and talk and present and tell me how important it is. Mm. You know what? I'd be looking to. I'd either be thinking I want to challenge this person, mm. I'm going to ask some tough questions of this person, yep. or I'd be thinking, get me out of here. I just want to go train. You're trying to take away from what I want to do yep. here. Mm. So, however, the reason athletes, or, or especially the ones in 
in, in rugby league, the the reason they do what they do is for their teammates mm. and for their coach. Mm. So I think it'd be incredibly difficult for the teammates to stand up there and tell them how you know tell you individually or get one of the group to stand up and talk about the level of importance. Mm. But the one person that could make the difference is the coach and actually say that act, you know for our cause of trying to win a premiership you being out there with a possible concussion is actually detrimental to that mm, absolutely uh, and i think i hope that's happening now more than ever um, not just in rugby league but in all sports where those coaches do see it's effectively them seeing the bigger picture and it also has to relate to the people inside their clubs who ultimately employ them that their their success or failure is not only defined just by what happens that weekend with that win or loss. There has to be a broader set of objectives and measurements for those people because to do that, you have to play the long game. Uh, and let's face it, professional sports aren't great at playing the long game. Everyone's strategy is about how you win this weekend. Yeah, and maybe there needs to be a slight adjustment of winning and performance culture yep. and some long-term health Definitely. culture. And, and that, is, again, is just striking that balance. Yeah. Um, uh, because in order, you know, you talked before about you had to make a decision as a relatively young kid to come out to Australia and which club to choose. It wasn't just about the money that you chose. It was about who you're working with, the environment you see yourself in. So players have choice in whatever sport it is, whether it's cricket, rugby league, AFL, and so those set of objectives on choice aren't defined only by their remuneration. It's about the type of coach, the type of coach, will he be looking after me as a person as well as a player, et cetera, et cetera. So the clubs that get that right, I think, have long-term sustainable success. And yeah. that's ultimately what you're looking for. Absolutely, they do. Um, some of the other, I guess, incidents. Headline uh, moments. Headline <laughs> moments. Um, clubs, Mad Monday fiascos. Yeah. How do you deal with that uh, as a CEO and all the, the phone calls and the fires that you would have to put out? I'm imagining it's sort of six, seven o'clock on, on the Monday in September and you're just waiting for the, for the <laughs> phone to go. Yeah, I mean, you can sort of smile about them now and, and you sort of reflect, but at the time, you know, they're, they're difficult because, as I said before, uh, it's a passion and emotional business. So when something happens off the field that goes wrong, um, everyone has a view, everyone has a voice, um, everyone has an opinion. So, yeah, we dealt with a number of those over the course of time. Um, it's no surprise that those things are going to happen from time to time and will continue to happen from time to time because you're dealing with a cohort of, I don't know, give or take 500 contracted footballers in the NRL. Um as you know better than most, some from very disparate backgrounds, some from different cultures and upbringings, and you're going to run into problems. And you are absolutely certain to run into problems when alcohol is involved. Yeah. So you're naive to think that you're not going to confront some of those issues. Do, do you have those conversations with major partners of, of the game? So, okay, I've got this product here. I'd mm. like you to partner with uh, on a commercial mm. level. Um However, do, do you discuss the potential for, for problems and how you would mm. address them if, if they are to manifest? Or is it Absolutely. just like, oh, here's the game, here's, here's the eyeballs on the game, here's mm. the p participants, here's our gross projections, yeah. sign here and be, be a major partner? Or do, do you discuss the, the potential downside? Yeah, I, I think... Absolutely, the answer is yes, because you can put all the, the glossy brochures together of metrics, but you need to make sure they understand what they're buying. Um, and they're buying an inexact science, an imperfect product in, in a lot of ways. And that example I shared with you before was an example that I've done with uh, uh, any number of CEOs of big companies who put lots of money into the sport was get them down close to the sideline to get them to understand what actually happens. Because different sitting up in the corporate box having a, a glass of wine with someone and you're, you know, 30 metres away from the sideline and you see someone score a try and it's all bells and whistles. But as I said, you stand on the short side and you see someone get squared up and you feel it and you can hear it. Um, that's what you're buying. Yeah. And you're going to buy that, that outcome occasionally. And you're dealing with individ individuals whose job description 
is to run as hard and as fast as they can into mm. you know other human beings exactly or, okay let's take you know 130 kilo yeah. and you're 90 kilos you've got to try and stop that person yeah. that's your job description that's or right. at least part of it yeah. now most people would go no thank you mm. we volunteer into this yeah it wouldn't take a it wouldn't take a genius to figure out that that, gonna be that, issues. that person yeah. you know is you know probably on a bit of a, a spectrum of behavior mm. at the far far reaching end where yeah. you know if if sport hadn't have come into their life they'd be yeah you know likely in jail yeah absolutely you know, a lot of some, some it's sports true. people end up in jail anyway with, with sport what i found was the decision makers of businesses who are investing, I'm talking about really serious investment in the sport, were less concerned about those issues. They were more concerned about how and what we did in order to support players and what programs we had in place and um, were we sophisticated and mature enough to try to get better over the time. So in other words, did we just see it as an issue and move on or did we have a lot of preventative and proactive measures in place to try to educate people and players and environments to actually be better and and i think we can proudly say there's a multitude of different ways that we tried to do those things where they got more problematic and that's probably where you're going to go to next is um it's, it's one thing for you know i'll say this in simple terms a player to get pissed at a mad monday and misbehave to really really high level criminal issues that created a much deeper issue for the game and started to create that commercial tension with people who are investing yeah um we we, we will we will get to that but just in terms of you, you on a on a mad monday how, yeah. how many like what's the next 48 hours looking like are you off the phone yeah oh, it's bedlam it's it's horrible um because the thing about those roles is you've got a huge number of stakeholders of which to communicate with and manage. You've got your own board, of which you've got to bring them on the journey and make sure that you're reporting effectively. And then you've got all those people that put money into the game, whether they're broadcast partners or sponsors. You've got your own staff, you've got fans, you've got media, quite often you've got government. So there's, oh, there's a litany of phone calls. So you're literally just only as good as how you communicate. Yeah, because I guess what, what in some instances with players being intoxicated and maybe not breaking the law yeah but there's you know footage of them doing something silly yeah. or there's yeah, photo yeah. you know it, yeah. th there's photographs there's photographs of them in compromising situations but you know perhaps you know be, being intoxicated I'm not sure even sure if that's illegal but mm. You know, you could say you know, m most people over the age of thirty would have been in that state, definitely, at some yeah, yeah. point in their life, but not yeah. had a you know so somebody photograph them and run it in the paper the yeah. next day. I mean, I, I I've been on both sides of this ledger. Um, I've been on the side of protecting and supporting players when they've got themselves into trouble, uh, and I've been criticised for that. And you've been criticised for going hard on a particular player. Um, I remember when Greg Inglis um, went DUI, um, Greg came to me and asked me to write him a reference when he went to court, which I did, because I knew him personally. I had huge respect for him. Um, I knew he'd done the wrong thing, but that doesn't mean you judge him to do the wrong thing for the rest of his life. So I wanted to vouch for him as a person. Now, I, I took huge um, negativity on that. But I sit here today saying it's the right thing to do. Greg Inglis is a good person who made a bad decision, who hasn't made a bad decision, and who hasn't made a bad decision who then needs some level of support. So it works both ways. Um, but again, if I wanted to be popular, I'd just stay silent on that. Yeah. But I was never looking to be popular. I was always looking to do what was right. And the right thing to do was support GI in that particular moment in time. Mm. And look at him now, he's thriving. Yeah. Um, Sometimes they're crossroad moments for people in their life. Yeah. And um, to bring up something you, you, you mentioned a, a moment ago, the, the no fault stand down policy. Yeah. Um, can you can you talk us through that? I was probably 
cricket critical of the fact um, an event had happened and then it came in. Yep. So, for example, if I was driving down the street at, and the speed limit is is eighty k's an hour, and but I'm going eighty k's. Yeah. Or, or say I'm going whatever. Say I'm going. This is a really poor example, and people pull me apart for it. But <laughs> say I'm going at eighty k's down this road. Yeah. And then, or, or there's no speed limit, and then all of a sudden the speed limit comes into forty. But I was going eighty k today, and the yep. speed limit then changes to forty the, the following week. Yeah. Um, so we, I saw you driving down there at eighty. We've got folk, we've got evidence. Mm. Okay, well we're going to charge you. Yeah. Well, hang on. It it was that that was the rules then, mm. but now the rules have changed. But mm. you're almost grandfathering the mm. the decision. Oh, look, I can understand that. I really can. Um, what I would probably say is the context of that period of time was we talked about off-field issues before. There was just this litany of off-field issues um, and they were becoming probably the most significant off-field concerns that I'd experienced in my time. Um, and I thought the game was under, I thought, I should say we thought, because this was very much a, a commission and a board and myself, we're all aligned on this decision, but we had to make a change to how the game was being governed with these sorts of issues. We couldn't continue to just rinse and repeat on behaviour and consequence, behaviour and consequence. We had to make a policy change. Um, and, you know, unashamedly, it was driven by a commercial sense that there were significant amounts of money at risk. And when I talked to lots of players, you being one of them at the time and lots of others, there were a number of players who said to me, this has to be the right call because what you're doing is protecting the game's revenues of which players take a percentage of. And if those revenues fall, um, then we all lose out of that. So that was that was the premise of the decision. Um, I understand your analogy of the retrospective yeah. angle and it happened at a period of time leading into the start of a season. Um, uh, was it perfect and did we get it all right? No, I don't think we did. Um, on some of those issues that have been to court and come... Um, did they take as did they take longer than we anticipated? Absolutely, um, and that was a byproduct of things out of our control. Yeah, but the principle of what the game was trying to achieve was to protect the game. Um, but I, I understand why it wasn't well served yeah. by lots of other people. Yeah, obviously there, there was an incident in particular that I was, you know, I was directly yeah. affected by. Yeah. Um, but also the fact that I guess, you know, as a society, I think we underestimate the how how great the presumption of innocence yeah. is, yeah. and that's a, I think that's one of the the bedrocks of our society, mm. and yeah. I, I I don't know if we value that enough, and it's yeah. taken for granted until you're in those shoes. Yeah. Completely, and until you've been in those shoes, it's very hard to judge, right? Yeah. Um, I would point out that it was called no fault stand down for that exact reason, that there was no assessment made on fault. I understand that the perception is yeah. different to that, so I completely get that. And that's why the policy also replicated that the person who was at no fault and stood down was paid. So there was they were sort of recognition of it being a no fault position. But um, as I said, I don't think it's a perfect science. Um, in saying that, though, in, in almost every major business, I think if you're facing those sorts of consequences, similar policies would probably be applied. Did you ever approach the government um, or the law enforcement agencies around um, amenity of professional players? So I know, for example, if a soldier mm. is charged, I remember at the, at the same time, actually, looking, there was two articles in the paper one about mm. a, a rugby league player being being charged with you know the um, some some crimes and some mm. quotes in the you know mm. the way the media quote it was in my opinion poor, in poor taste and yeah. it's it's almost written as fact rather yeah. than this is what is accused but for example um it would be soldier a has been charged with yeah. x y or z and that they due to the nature of their profession they are afforded that um, the, the 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 names are withheld from the from the press, and you know, people can argue whether that's right or wrong. But was that ever considered? Um, 
look, I can't say off the top of my head that it was considered, but you work a little bit in the media now, so I suppose I'd reverse that question and say, do you think that anything in rugby league that could be kept out of the public eye? Because, you know, history tells me that this is very hard to keep a secret in rugby league. That would probably be, a, I mean, as noble as that would be and probably as as fundamentally just as it would be, I'm not sure if it's achievable. Well, I know in the Premier League, in the English Premier League at the moment, mm. or perhaps a couple of months ago, I know a, a player had been questioned on some significant charges, mm. but mm. not charged, and mm. their name was kept, I think it was instructed by the magistrate to be kept, That's a really good to be thing. kept out of, That's a of great the thing. press. It was just like, yeah. it, I think all that was given was, uh, it was a, it was a London-based... Mm. I'd like to see more of that in all forms of life, to be fair. Um, athletes and others, but not sure if it's achievable. It'd, mm. be, it'd be a much cleaner and a lot fairer way in order to deal with it. And, you know, we talked a bit, of, just referenced that AFL example at the moment. I mean, those coaches, rightfully or wrongfully, their names are out there um, on allegations at the moment. And, and now that, that burden of proof, as you've just talked about, it's almost reversed. Yeah. Um, that's a hard thing to deal with. Yeah. It, it, and look, again, I, I do not, un, under any circumstances, envy the position that you were in. Yeah. And yeah. The, the different pressures and, and the different points of view from even the, the playing group. Yep. You know, obviously yep. I, was, I, was at, I was at a club where this yeah. was I remember fundament, to visit fun, yeah, fundamentally yeah. going to be affecting yep. all of us. You yep. know, and we were, you know... All, we were all there living it every single day. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I remember it well. And I remember, you'll remember this too, driving to Wollongong to stand in front of your team, your squad, in the middle of that the, at its most heightened. You know, and I had people on, you know, the NRL side saying, well, why are you going down there to talk to those players? You, you're crazy to do that. My view is the opposite. Like, you've got to turn up. You've got to have the conversation. You've got to answer the questions doesn't mean when I left that room, you and I agreed on everything mm. or all of your counterparts agreed. But I remember I walked out and you walked me in my car and you said, well, done, mate, that was pretty tough in there and thanks for coming. I remember you said that to yeah. me. And well, I, you know, I appreciated you, you yeah. showing up. Because it would be easy not to show up. Yeah, and just let them get on yeah. with it. But that, that wasn't me. Mm. But there's, there's times when people, you say you take inputs and advice we talked about earlier. There's lots of advice saying don't drive to Wollongong and... You're mm. walking into a lion's nest down there. They're going to hammer you for that. I took the opposite. I said, thanks for your input. My gut instinct tells me I've got to go and face them and have a chat to them. Mm. In 2016, when Parramatta lost all their salary cap points, I went to Kellyville and stood inside a demountable shed in front of the players and explained to them why. And everyone at my side said, well, you're mad. What are you going to drive out there for? If the players want to know about it, they should come and talk to you. Come into Moore Park. And I said, we're taking all their points off them. These guys have trained yeah. all preseason. They've busted their asses there. And I'm the person who's taking the points off them. For them not doing anything wrong, I'm going to go and talk to them, explain it to them. And that was, that was like on my top 10 list of the most horrible experiences that I've had to do. But I tell you what, I, I wasn't going to walk away until I finished answering every single one of their questions. Um, again, I'm not being popular, but hopefully some respect. Well, I think... People deserve that. Absolutely, they, do, they, do. they deserve the explanation from the from the yeah. key stakeholders. I I, um, I do remember that day you coming down, and this is a a story for another day. But <laughs> I remember you, um, Jeremy Lattimore, had some things to say, and you just completely shot him down. And <laughs> it, um, after we'd had that little conversation, I think three or four of us were just straight into Jeremy Lattimore for some uh, uninformed information <laughs> he presented to you that day, which. Oh God! It still tickles me to this day. Uh, I wish I wish I could remember it as well. But oh. uh, know your subject matter. That's the key there for Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was it was brilliant. You absolutely blew his legs off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, with your uh, your tenure at the the, the NRL, mm. um, are you proud of what you managed to achieve? Yeah, very much so. Um, proud of what we achieved, and also um, I thoroughly enjoyed the ride. And it is a hell of a journey. Um, you know, I made some amazing friendships and relationships. And, you know, the one question I get asked more than anything since I've left is, who do you actually go for? And I watch uh, footy now so differently. I really couldn't care who won or lost in a particular game. 
I follow people and individuals because of the relationships you make. Um, when Melbourne Storm play, you know, I'm such a great fan of Craig Bellamy. I'd call him a mate. I hope he does well. When the Sharks were playing last year and Aidan Tolman was in his last season, and you know Aidan as well as I do, there's not many better blokes that I've met in the game than Aidan. And I just wanted him to do really well. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't watch it through the lens of the team. I watch it through those individuals and knowing the the journeys and the sacrifices they've made. And that's how I that's how I watch the game now. When when you look back, um, is is there regret? Is there regret at all? I'm I'm looking and thinking about you know the the mega TV broadcast deal that we signed, and mm. you came in for some criticism mm. for how that money was spent. Mm. We, would you like that time over again? Oh, look, I think in, in hindsight, there's always things you'd do differently. Um, I mean, the reality of my time was in every year that I was there, we grew revenue. In every year that we are there, TV ratings and eyeballs and all those sorts of things increased and we were able to get enormous benefit and infrastructure out of government, which we're now seeing now, new stadiums being built. They don't pop up overnight. They happen from five, six, seven years ago and those discussions and negotiations. So... Um, yeah, there's, there'd be some things I'd do slightly differently. Um, but, you know, by and large, when I walked in and when I walked out, I left the game in better shape. Um, and I know that through the numbers and the metrics. Um, and in any of these roles, whether you're at the Bulldogs or you're at the NRL or where I am now, those roles are much bigger than any individual. So, so what you do is you go in, you work your ass off, and you then hand it over to somebody else to have a crack. Um, and it's a finite experience. Any leadership role can't be there for too long because you need fresh ideas and new people. So I was always conscious of having a crack, doing my best and then moving, you know. And at the Bulldogs, it was before your time in 2008 when I arrived there, that was wooden spoon territory, four wins for the year, you know, the club's on its, on its knees. Um, and when I left, we'd just been pipped in a grand final. Um, so you, you just work hard, you do your best, um, and you then hopefully turn it over for someone to take it to the next level. Um, and you don't, I don't think you can take that too personally. Yeah. So with that, did that TV de- deal, because I'm going to ask about the, the, the current one at the moment, mm. Mm. Um, would you have looked to invest more in? Yeah. Well, that's the real question. To, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, I think that's some of the, you know, yeah. I've read that the criticism is we, we didn't actually buy anything. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely. Um, warranted to to ask that question because it wasn't the the revenue generation that was poor the revenue generation was unbelievable um you know we had double digit compound growth every year in revenue so there was more money than ever the question really is did you invest it and put that in the right areas or get assets yeah yeah and so you know when you look at that at the time you've got huge and hungry stakeholders being the clubs the players the states game development and and should you be investing in those areas or should you be holding back and saying well we're not going to give all that money out to the stakeholders we're going to hold some back and buy some properties investment i mean the biggest investment we made in my time there was investing in nrl digital which in in our view was a huge long-term play for the sport to own some of its own assets um they've decided to go in a different direction that's completely their choice um so there are pros and cons of some of that but you know, when you get hit by a pandemic, clearly you look back in the rearview mirror and you go, well, should we have invested some other areas? And um, I think that's a real challenge for the next generation for rugby league is what do they do and where do they invest and how do they make that so that the clubs, the stakeholders, the players are remunerated in that period of time, but there's also enough money for elsewhere. What do you think about the the current TV deal? Um, well, do you, only... Do you have any thoughts on it at all? Only or? really what I've read. What I've read is that the AFL have done a, a cracking deal. Good luck to them. Um, rugby league is a great sport, so it deserves equally the same types of revenue. So hopefully they can generate those in the next deal. When you when you resigned from your position at the NRL, mm-hmm. um, was there was there tension there? Oh, absolutely. Did you, did you feel? Yeah. Did you feel like you you were you were pushed into that like tension had got too much? Yeah, I mean, in any sense. Um, there comes a time when you don't have an alignment with others. And that's how I felt at that time. Um, my contract was coming up for renewal at that period of time anyway. It was not far off. Um, the question for me and for others was 
stay or go. Um, and you have to you have to work in an environment that you think you can succeed, and you also have to work in an environment where you think that you're aligned with others in those leadership roles. And so for me, it was a pretty clear and easy decision to make at the time. What was behind that lack of alignment? Um, like was uh, there was there tension there? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's always tension. Yeah, there's, so, there's so always that's a tension. Silly question, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the end of the day, the CEO of, of a sport reports into a board, reports into a commission, and the alignment between the board and the CEO has to be complete. And at that point in time, it wasn't for me. So that ultimately made my decision for me. What, what was the major sticking points? Oh, look, I think some of them was just the direction of the game and, and how to apply that and how to best do it. And I'd been doing it for... You know, a number of years, I had my own style and my way of doing things, and there was clearly going to be a different way. Um, so I had to make a decision, and you can compromise your own set of personal values and beliefs, and some of the way you do things, or or not. And I chose to not. Have Have you spoke to Peter Vlandi since? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. There's no um, bad blood between Peter and I. Um, I sit on the board of Venues New South Wales now, which is responsible for all of the stadium development. So um, I've had connections with uh, the NRL and all the other sports through that role. Um, yeah, there's no no personal problem for Peter and I. Um, uh, I think he and Andrew are doing a great job for the game. They've got some huge challenges on their plate. Um, but that's what the role is. You always have huge challenges to deal with and they've got to make some big decisions in the coming period of time. And I hope they do well. I, I said this on the way out and I'll say it today. I love rugby league. I love the sport. It's been very good to me and my family. Um, and I'll always be a fan of the game. What do you think the NRL needs to focus on long term now? Well, I think in the next period of time, the the continued opportunity and explosion of females at the elite level um, will be very, very important. Um, the AFL are now going to a full competition, both male and female. Um, that will create huge opportunities for that sport whether it's government commercial those sorts of things so i think that will definitely be on their plate um and i think the concerns around what we talked about before the collision sport and how you keep player safety and welfare at the forefront of your decision making will also be a great challenge i mean it, we talked before the start of concussion protocols was give or take 2013 that's nine or ten coming up to ten years um the next decade of evolution of those principles and policies and procedures will have to be on fact-based research. But there are going to be changes to the game that people won't like. There'll be changes to rules that die-hard rugby league fans probably aren't going to want to be in place. But the decision will have to be what's best for the players. Mm. I think it... Well, you've never been allowed to hit anybody in the head. It's just how you, Absolutely. How you police that. Yeah, and I think what you've seen, you know this as well as I do, it's... Concussion was used to be seen through the lens of the ball carrier being hit in the head and being concussed. Um, there's a lot of concussions coming from the defender. Um, All three in state of origin. Yeah. So it's state of origin to side away, yeah. So that gives you a very different challenge in how do you confront the collision sport when players are being concussed as the defender, not the attacker. Um, so that creates other challenges, which, again, you have to confront those. Yeah. Hey, actually... Before we get on to the Bulldog stuff, um, I wanted to ask you, in 2018, mm -hmm. you let a crackdown on, uh, basically, the referees were instructed mm. to sort of hold him down in the rock, and mm. there was lots of penalties. Yeah, yeah. And that changed around halfway through the, mm. the year. There was a lot of people, oh, they, they were sick of penalties. Mm. I think there was one game where there was... Yeah, so 20 plus yeah, yeah. penalties in the game yeah. and saying it was ruining it. I, I thought if the NRL had held out for a little bit longer, mm. you would have got compliance because mm. the coach, it was a game of cat, cat and mouse. mouse. Yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. all right, well, we'll, the coaches were going, no, nah, they, they won't blow. We'll, we'll win. Yeah, yeah. I, I personally, I, I, I thought the NRL was so close to cleaning it up, mm. but there seemed to be a, change in direction yeah i remember that time well and again i talked before about you know you it's quite often in these roles you're the senior person you're making decisions but you know the the nrl had a very sophisticated and mature approach to these things through the competition committee um you know there's some great people on that competition committee ivan cleary was on at the time 
In fact, I I reflect I've reflected on this a lot over the last month or two. Paul Green was on that committee, and I became great mates with Paul over the period of time. And um, you know, his sudden passing recently just absolutely floored me. Um, but he was on that committee, and and uh, so there was some very smart football people on that group, um, and we worked hard through that period. The question that I'll never be able to answer for you is if if we did continue down that track, um, what would it have looked like? And how would it have looked like? Um, they're hard moments because there's some some games that you look at and they're so hard to watch with so many penalties. But knowing the the cat and mouse game between coaches and interpretations and yeah, it's how long do you hold on for? Yeah, and there was a lot of media pressure. There is, yeah, it'd be some from some very powerful voices that yeah, and it wasn't just the NRL ruining the game; it was you. Yeah, yeah, it was you're, you, Todd Greenberg, you're yeah, yeah. ruining this product. Yeah. And we want to see fast flowing, but not, yeah. we don't care if someone's slightly offside yeah. or slightly holding them yeah, down. Yeah. And you know, it, it it almost seems it will all come full. It, it all comes full circle. Like, oh, hang on, they're getting away with murder now. Yeah. Well, we have yeah. an opportunity. Oh, we need to start right. penalising that. Yeah. It's uh, it's. I hear this. Uh, I heard this recently when I was seeing watching a game where they're talking about a forward pass, and they said, "Well, why doesn't the bunker check for that?" Mm. And it was the same person who said that that said, "Why do we have the bunker going all the time?" We should have less of the bunker yeah. until such time as there's a decision where they want to use it. So it, it always it sort of brought a smile on my face, some of those things, because it's such a such a divergent set of views. But, um, again, you're not there to please everyone. you just got to do what you think's right. And a lot of people that would contradict themselves. I know oh. I've said things that yeah. <laughs> if you were to look back and then fast forward a month, you'd be like, well, hang on. Yeah. A month ago, yeah. you said this. Yeah, completely. But then... You know, it's yeah. s- something will happen, and then all of a sudden, yeah. But yeah. it's always a, it's always a but. But, but for a, cl- so I think there was a, you know, one one of the things around the forward pass. It was Mitchell Moses yeah. forward pass um, in the recent game up at Townsville. So, yeah. Well, you've got to bring the bunker in. You've got to bring the bunker in for like howls. howlers. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, who defines what howler is? That's right. Yeah, some will say, well, that was an obvious one. Well, it was obvious to you, yeah. but it's not obvious to someone else. Yeah. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Mm. And w- w- what's a not obvious one? Yeah, that's right. Mm. So someone would say, only l- rule on blatant forward passes. <laughs> what's a blatant sure, forward well, pass? You'd, you'd hope that the referee and the touch judges would that's be their able job. to pick up a blatant that's forward pass. That's their job. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. So it, technology is your friend, but it's also your foe. Yeah, uh, and you pay a price for everything you do and you don't do. And oh, what's your fun- fundamental... What's your mission statement yeah. for, for a game? Is it to get all the all the decisions right? Yeah. Is that what you want? Yeah, it's well, not possible. It, yeah. And if it is, yeah. what, what's it going to look like? Yeah. Because I don't know if you actually want all the decision, decisions yeah. to be right. Completely. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting because we talk about the bunker. That was the first major project um, on my plate when I arrived at the NRL through 13 to 15. It took us a couple of years to bring that technology in. And, um, you know, I remember going through and looking at how many errors does a referee make in a particular game? When you analyse his performance, how many errors on average does a referee make? And then how many er- errors on average does a player make? How many missed tackles? How many drop balls? Um, and so when you put it together, there's 26 players and the referees on the field. They're all human beings. So over the course of 80 minutes, everyone's going to make mistakes. But people judge mistakes on the impact they have on the game as opposed to the mistake itself. And so mistakes made at crucial moments are the ones that really matter. And we do hold people in auth- in positions of authority to a higher standard. Absolutely we do. It's a natural yeah. thing that we do. Yeah. We don't realise we're doing it. Like yeah. the referee would probably be, you know, the referee in this year's grand final would be the yeah. lowest paid individual outside of the yep. touch judges. Yeah, yeah. But they he's, would be... He's ha- the best in his field. He's the best, best in his, in his field. field. At all here, best yep. in the field. Right. And... But they would be on the least amount, yeah. And but a decision wrong or an yeah. error, pfft. world explodes. Wow, yeah, I know. It's quite amazing. Don't worry about the missed tackle, yeah. But that other star player that's on, on more, it's just it, it fascinates me yeah. psychologically, yeah, how all that works, yeah. Uh, it is, and it goes back to the point I made earlier, mate. It's a, it's a business, but it's based on emotion and passion. Mm. And so, when you put emotion and passion in, um. The greatest example of emotion and passion I remember is, you'll tell me if I'm wrong on this, 2014 Good Friday. You know, you remember that? That was Mm. like, that's what makes the game great. Mm. That's why people loved you as a player because everything was on the line. Yeah. And that emotion and passion, you would never change that. Mm. 
but having decisions through the lens of emotion and passion make it bloody hard to decipher. Um, so that's that's the beautiful, imperfect part of the game. And, and our game is very subjective as well. I, yeah. think, I think it was Todd that you, you came to a group of the players and you showed some examples from like a ref camp. Yeah. And you said, what, we, what would you guys yeah, yeah. do here? Yeah. Like, is it a strip or is it a knock yeah. on? Yeah. In, and half the room. And, half, and the, the, exactly. the room is split. Oh, well, yeah. I think that. Yeah. And you've got the, we've got the ability to look at it through yeah. you know, multiple TV angles. Yeah. And then there's another one where I think I remember that at, at like a local game and the the winger gets tackled really close to the yes. sideline. Yes. And the, the center goes into dummy half and his foot is out, out. and passes the ball right. and all the crowd are blown up. Yeah. You know, what, what happens here? And you go, well, yeah, he's in touch. Yeah. And all the players were like, no, he's yeah. in touch. It's like, no, he's yeah, not. That's not the rule. That's not the rule. That's right, exactly. The rule is you can actually, yeah. if you're at dummy half, yeah. you can have your foot outside yeah. the field of play, pass the ball to that's right. the receiver, yeah. and that's play on. play on. Yeah, And I, I reckon 99% of yeah. rugby league viewers yeah. would not know that rule. Absolutely. I, as a player, had no, I'd be like, no, yeah. no. If, and if I, I'm thinking, again, imagine being in the middle of a game and seeing that. I would yeah. be blowing up deluxe. Exactly. Like, how have you missed that climb yeah. there? Like you yeah. talk about, you know, Absolutely. bring the bunker in, captains yeah, yeah. challenge it. Yeah. Well, you're wrong. You're wrong. Sorry, mate. That's right. Yeah. I'm glad you remember some of those examples because I spent quite a bit of time at one point spending time with players trying to give them context and perspective. Yeah. So that obviously resonated with you at the it time. It did, massively. And I, and I remember at the time, again, being popular, I got criticised so much in my previous role for being too close to players. I remember being criticised enormously by certain parts of the media for being too close to players at certain times. I remember Sam Burgess had some missteps off the field and I asked him to sit down with me and talk about it. And I thought, and I still think, that's the right thing to do. To build relationships with people, you have to spend time with them. So I spent a lot of time with Sam and then I sanctioned him afterwards. Um, but the criticism of that was, for me, really strange. Um, and interestingly, going into the job now at cricket, that was seen as an advantage because the players said, we, we want to be close to someone who actually represents our interests. So it's it's quite interesting in life how sometimes a negative can be a positive. Yeah, it is. Um, it really is. Um, going to the time at the Bulldogs, I've always yeah. wanted to ask you this around the capture of Des Hasler. So yeah. I'd signed in 2011. Yep. I had a, a pretty much a season to to play out at St. Helens, obviously delighted to come, signed him to coach Kevin Moore. He gets sacked midway through the season. And, yep. you know, I, I had no idea who was going to be my coach. Manly are playing in the grand final. Mm. And still the, the coach for the Bulldogs for season 2020, 2012 is yet to be appointed. And then, mm. wow, what a week that was. Can you tell us a little bit about the build up, how you managed to get the premiership winning coach, Des Hasler, over to the dogs? Yeah. Yeah. Um well, it was a good period of time, that's for sure. It was, it was certainly done uh, in the dark of night, um, and I can tell you that, as I said before, there's not many secrets in rugby league. That was pretty good, that one, for a period of time. Um, when, when we were looking for a coach, um, I was unsure of the type of coach we should be searching for. Um, and I drove to Wollongong. I never, never told this story. I drove to Wollongong to have a coffee with Wayne Bennett, who was coaching St George at the time, but had already signed to go to Newcastle with Nathan Tinkler. So I wasn't going down to talk to Wayne about coming to the Bulldogs. I was going down to talk to Wayne as the game's most experienced coach and to ask him for his views and opinions because I knew that in having some limited contact with him, he cared a lot about the whole game. He had a view. of. So I sat with him and he, and he really simplified it. He said, so Todd... As a CEO of a club, you're looking for a coach. When you look at coach, I won't say the name, coach number such and such, what do you see that team playing like? And I describe what I might see. And he said, so when you look at my team, the Dragons, what do you see? And I, and I sort of described it as a team that's very hard to beat, unbelievably defensive, uh, good defensive structures and uh, very well organised. And so he said, well, you need to find a coach that matches the type of players and, and game you want to replicate and he said to me he said there's a guy sitting up in the northern beaches and he said he's one of the best coaches out there and he's not valued by his own club go and have a chat to him 
And that's as simple as it was. I literally found his number and rang him, cold called him. And he took the call and the rest is history. Well, so. <laughs> the rest is history. It is, but the beer, obviously the, the top secret mission. Um, ha, you know, you, you say the, the rest is history, but <laughs> how, was, how was the process? So I, I know Der, Des is very secretive. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it, it, I'm, I think the deal was signed originally for 2013. That's but right. It, the yeah. ink was already dry before it all yep. came out, and I believe he was very strict in mm. if this gets out, then yep. the deal's off. That's right. Yeah, he was. He was, he was taking his team to what he kept saying to me in those months of July and August in that year. I've got a team that can win the comp this year, is what he said to me. I was like, yeah, I think all coaches say that. And then it, as August developed and the finals were underway, he just said to me, if any of this gets out. So when did he actually sign? Uh, leading into the grand final. So it was that, it was that week. Mm. So you're having these discussions. We we're having those discussions through the months prior. And, you know, his season was undergoing and we would meet late at night um, at the end of a, end of a day and... And for him, he was interviewing me as much as I was interviewing him um, because he wanted to know what he was getting himself into and I wanted to know what I was buying. Um, and, you know, people talk about the commercial terms of a contract negotiation, but that one was simple because I said to him, what do you think a coach is worth if he wins the premiership? What's a number that you think you're worth if you win the comp? So he gave me a number and I said, well, why don't we start with half of that and then build a whole pile of performance metrics so we'll get you that number if you win. That's how we did it. Of course, he started very close to the number and I started further away <laughs> and we just worked our way through the middle. But I said to him, I, I agree with you. A coach should get that amount of money if he wins a comp. Win a comp and that's exactly what you'll get. And the bugger almost did in the first mm. year. What was he... What was he like to, to deal with? I mean, was it... This is... This is my way. Like he's coming in and he's got the keys to everything. No, not quite. Um, I said to him that in my perception of him at Manly over those times, he was doing too many things. And one of the advantages, I think, of him coming at that time was he only needed to worry about the football team and the performance of that team and the preparation. We had a pretty mature setup at the Bulldogs at that time, and you remember it. So I said, we'll get you over. We'll give you all the resources and tools you need to be successful. And I used this analogy with him at the time. There'll be times when I have to pull out a red flag for you and say that's not happening. You report to me. That won't happen often. It won't happen in football, but it'll happen across the club. The club's bigger than anyone else. So occasionally I'll have to do that for you. And uh, he said, oh, I've been longing for this for a period of time. So that's why I think we work well together. Um, and there was a, a period very early on where I said, red flag, he said, got it, no problem. Um, and a story I haven't shared, which you may remember, is we were um, we had a very big partnership with Camp Quality at the time. And uh, Camp Quality is an organisation that helps kids and families who go through cancer. And I said to Des before he joined, I said, because he had those long flowing locks, I said to him, mate, I reckon one of the things you could do to engage yourself with the new club would be to shave your head for charity. He said, you've got to be nuts. He said, why would I do that? I said, imagine if I could get someone, if I could create $100,000, if I could create 100000 bucks, would you do it? And he said, if you could get 100000 mate, good luck. No one's going to put 100000 into that. He didn't know that I'd already got Gary Johnson from JCAR to write a check for 100000 And so I had it, and then within days, his wife was watching him get his head shaved. I remember It was that. one, it was one yeah. of the great moments. And it, it sort of demonstrated to me that there's – wasn't the the hard ass nutty professor that people had his image a bit like you said you know you want to show the opposition and get in their heads there's a bit of that in Des too mm. when you break Des down he's a beautiful kind caring man his wife calls all the shots in his home and he is as smart and as articulate as they come um behind the man there's a lot of bravado i, I it's I character, think, uh, absolute character. He it's is a character. He, he is a great he, man. Is it? Is it? But he, his, his press. He, I literally see it. He, he puts on 
Yeah, puts Carl, on a show. He puts on a show. He's and got it's, a, it's a character. He, it is. It's multi. It's multi. It's also it's borderline personality disorder. Absolutely. He changes who he is when he goes yeah. into a press conference. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've got a great friendship with him. Uh, we talked before about parts of the games. You know, when Manly play now, I'm not a big Manly fan, but I want Des to do well. Mm. You know, because he's a great person. Um, and so, if you ever really needed something to get done, you just talk to Christine. Just yeah, should sort him out. <laughs> In terms of Daz coming over, obviously he'd originally signed for 2013. That's right. How did that change so suddenly? Well, basically, I think, and it's happened a few times in the game's history where a club sees that their coach has made a decision a year from that, and you know how these clubs work. Every decision you make in one year reflects what's happening in the future. So they saw that as a easy way to part ways quickly. And for us at the Bulldogs, it was perfect because we got theirs quicker than we anticipated. Um, and at the time, we were all prepared to wait. Um, but we got him quicker than anticipated. And, you know, we then went into a unbelievable 2012 season where, you know, we shot the lights out. I think from memory, we won 16 or 17 games in a row at one yeah, point. I think, I think you're um, right. And just got pipped in the grand final. Yeah. It's a hell of a journey for you, year one. Yeah, it was. It was um, almost surreal. Yeah. J- just with, with Des coming over as well. He asked for a lot. Yeah. He asked for a lot. Yeah. Of, of everybody. Yeah. What was that like? So I know we had we had some equipment that perhaps m- maybe some would seem as mm. unnecessary. Or, yep. um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he stretched it far and hard. Um, but also he stretched the players further and harder than they'd ever been stretched to. Mm. And the example I give is... He asked me to send him over the um, the preseason training schedules that were already being devised because he wasn't there yet. So I sent them over, and within minutes of me sending the email, he rang me and he said, "You sent me the wrong ones." And I said, "No, I haven't." He said, "These can't be it. This looks like New South Wales Cup. This looks like reserve grade." I said, "No, that's the NRL schedules." He said, "Mate, are you sure you're ready for me?" And I said, "Absolutely, we're ready for you." And I, I don't know if you remember this, but I heard players used to say they were coming, they were coming to train. I heard them, their language changed to, we've got to go to work. We're going to work. And it was harder and more intense than an environment that I'd ever seen. Well, my, I can remember that because I came over from the Super League. The pre-seasons were much shorter over there. You know, there was a... I had it in my mind what the NRL preseason was going to be like. I imagine it was going to be a lot tougher, yeah. a lot longer. Obviously, the heat, all that jazz. But then I was in it and just going, what is this? Yeah. But then for me, you know, speaking to the other players, they were like, no, no, this is, this is harder than normal, mate. Yeah. This, is, this is next level stuff. And I was like, okay, so it's not just, not just me. No. Like, yeah, yeah. We, we were all suffering. And then even into the season, the, the schedule was intense. And again, to, to put some context to that, um, the previous coaches at the Bulldogs, going right the way back into, I think, the 90s, were all part of the family club yeah. dynasty. And so the appointment of Des broke a cultural, historical component of the Bulldogs. So again, I go back to that being popular or being a leader, it was certainly my view and the view of the board at the time, which was we need a significant and distinct change in our culture and how we prepare. We can't continue to rely on the old bulldogs of old. Mm. We've got to get more professional. And in order to do that, we've got to make a distinct change. In any vocation, people don't like change. So Des was a huge change. So part of that change was giving him and equipping him with tools and resources. Some of them... (laughs) <laughs> were a little over the top. Um, but some of them were also designed to show him that I cared and I backed him. You've got his back. I've got your back, Des, and, mate, you and I are going to see it through. And when we got to grand final day, I remember vividly just he and I looking at each other and saying, it's a pretty good turnaround, so I had 12 months. And when I left the Bulldogs, I think I had seven years of the Dogs. I, I loved it. I loved the club. I still love the club. But one of the great memories I take out was on the my last day uh, was a round game against Parramatta, um, literally 20 minutes before kickoff. Uh, I went down to wishing good luck. 
And he said to me, can you do me a favour? Can you address the players before they run out tonight? I said, you can't be serious, mate. That's got nothing to do. I never went in the dressing rooms. In fact, the only time I really went in the dressing rooms was when we lost to make sure people knew that we were together. It's easy to go into the winner's dressing room. It's another thing to go into a, a losing dressing room. And he afforded me this unbelievable chance to stand in front of the group before you run out. And, and it says a lot about Des because he doesn't let anyone mm. inside a footy program. He's so intense and he's so protective. So um, I had a very unique relationship with Des. And I think, again, on reflection, for any CEO of a club, if you're the person that appoints the coach, you set the standards and benchmark in that relationship as opposed to a CEO who inherits a coach. Yeah. Very, very difficult. I would think that if you inherited Des as a coach, it would be hard work. If you appoint him and you have all those red flag discussions early, that's a much better way. That was proven in uh, in the next who came in. Yeah. Uh, final final thing on Bulldogs challenge, challenging with Des. Um, there was an incident at the end of 2012 around Benny Barber. Mm. A lot of press come your way. Mm. But yeah, how did you deal with that? That was, that was hard, mate. That was a hard moment, um, knowing Ben and his family. Um, and Ben's gone on and had some other issues in his life that I had to deal with at the NRL as well. But at that period of time, it's one thing to, to think about what might be happening in someone's life, and it's another thing for actually to have confirmed proof or evidence or even someone willing to talk about it. And a uh, very, very difficult thing to handle at that period of time. Um, and Ben was an unbelievable talent on the field, but he was a pretty troubled individual off it. Um, and I'm not sure if he ever recovered from some of those moments later in his life either, which is quite sad. Yeah, but in terms of, it was hearsay. Yeah. It was rumour. Yeah. And perhaps you were privy to information, but mm. there, there was no actual charge from the police. No. Which was I, I guess, from your point of view, you can't take it into your mm. hands, can you? No, there was not only was there no charge in the police, there was actually no complaint. Um, so, yeah, people would like to put a position forward, but in positions like mine, you can only act on what the evidence is in front of you. Um, and at that time, there was nowhere for us to go. Um, and as I said, it was difficult because, again, you've got to you've got to decide. Of, uh, make a decision based on facts and information, not what the media pressure of the day is coming at you. Because um, responding to that will forever be painful down the track. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I um, think we better wrap this up, Todd. It's been Great fun, an mate. absolute privilege to, to sit and talk with you. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, have a little jog down memory lane and, and bring up some, some tough conversations, mate, and, and go through some issues that yeah. uh, have fascinated me and I'm sure will fascinate our listeners. So um, on behalf of everyone at the Buy Round, thank you, for, thank you for joining us and all the very best for your future endeavours. I look forward to getting you to some cricket at some point in the next 12 months, mate, and uh, great to spend some time with you. Congratulations on the work you're doing post-career. It's good stuff. Thank you.